In his current position as the chief engineer for Fair Winds Associates. That's Fair Winds with an E, F A I R E, Winds Associates. Arnie testifies on behalf of municipalities and intervenes regarding uh, engineering flaws and safety issues in atomic power reactors. His testimony provided highly valuable information in the investigation of the Three Mile Island nuclear meltdown in the United States. Concerned about the ongoing problems and the inaction of both TEPCO, that's Tokyo Electric Power Company, and the Japanese government to mitigate the triple meltdown at the Fukushima Daiichi site, Arnie has appeared as a regular guest on media outlets such as Democracy Now!, even CNN, to discuss the ongoing catastrophe. He has written Fukushima Daiichi, The Truth and the Way Forward, published in Japan by Shouisha Publishing Company, number one on Amazon JP Science for four to five months, 41st bestseller of the year in 2012 in soft covered nonfiction. His website is fairwinds.org. I repeat, F A I R E wins.org. And let me see, what else? Well, he and his wife, Maggie, whom I just saw and met, even though Arnie had his headphones in, so I couldn't really speak to her, uh, president and founder of Fairwinds Energy Education, a 501c3 nonprofit, just returned from a three week speaking tour in California, including presentations at Sonoma State University and Cal Poly Technical University, as well as seven other venues. So here he is, Arnie Gunderson. Welcome to Caravan to Midnight. Good to have you back. Hi, John. Yeah, it's nice to be back. Thanks. Well, I take it things aren't getting better. So since we last spoke, where have you been? What is, what is it uh, uh, Buffalo Bill said to Wild Bill Hickok in, uh, in that movie Wild Bill? Tell me, old pard, where have you been? <laughs> I think that's what he said. <laughs> well, we just spent, um, Maggie and I just spent three weeks in California. Uh, you know, as you said, it was uh, Sonoma State and Cal Poly and uh, seven other venues in between. Um, and, of course, it, it's interesting, the, the west coast of the United States is much more aware that Fukushima continues to be, you know, a, a disaster in the making uh, compared to the, the East Coast. People seem to have forgotten here on the East Coast, but the West Coast is a different problem because you still have the contamination in the Pacific and it's getting worse. And then the other place I'll be is um, beginning in February, I'm going to be in Japan for a month. So it's been a busy travel. Boy. All right, so if we um, if we go to um, my favorite website for this sort of thing is that's that's my quote there on uh, enenews.com. They they uh, feature your commentary and, and articles frequently. Uh, it's it's just I'm telling you, it's just one horror story after another. But none of this makes uh, none of it makes its way into mainstream news. Here you go. This is from uh, December the 10th. Red alert: sharp increase in radiation at Fukushima. Level spike: four hundred thousand percent. Four hundred thousand percent, not just 400, almost 1 billion becquerels per cubic meter. I mean, yeah. what's the end game here, sir? You know, I, I've, I've said now since 2011 that there really is no end game. This, this is the, the worst industrial accident in the history of the world. And, you know, Tokyo Electric and the Japanese needed to fight it like it was a war in 2011. They, there was an opportunity right when it happened to prevent a lot of this radiation from getting into the groundwater and into the Pacific. And they didn't seize the moment. They, they didn't attack it with the money and the um, passion that it needed back in 2011. And now we're all paying the price. I mean, this thing continues to bleed into the Pacific. Um, and also, you know, we can't forget that the hills around the plant are heavily contaminated too. So um, I think it's a hundred year problem. I think it will be a uh, hundred years before they remove those nuclear cores. Arnie, tell us this, what should they have done? I was thinking uh, if it's so hot you can't get in there, what could have been done in your opinion? Of course, you you know, we can always look back and say what we think should have happened. So let's just take, let's just do that rather than be just over the top definitive, unless you can be. Yeah. What well, should they have done that they did not do? Actually, I, I said what they should have done in 2011, and I'm really not the only person. Uh, the, the plant manager at Fukushima uh, was a brilliant guy who, who died of cancer uh, uh, after the accident. But anyway, he also said, we've got to stop the groundwater from getting into the building. And there was an opportunity back 
in 2011 to build um, a zeolite wall. Uh, some of your viewers may use zeo zeolite as a, as a pill because it's a very effective absorber of cesium and, and other chemicals. Um, they could have, not on the ocean side, but on the inland side, built a wall probably six feet deep down to bedrock, maybe 90 feet, then filled it with zeolite. And the zeolite then would have prevented the cesium from leaking out and heading inland. Now, the, the, the second half of the problem was that would have allowed them on the inland side of that wall, not on the plant side, but on the inland side, to pull down the water table. And if they had pulled down the water table with that wall in place, they would have prevented the groundwater from going into the nuclear containment. Now what we've got is the, the, the complete meltdown of the core lying on the bottom of the nuclear reactor containment, likely breaking its way through that concrete because of chemical reactions plus the heat. And whether the core has actually left the containment or not is irrelevant because what's really happened is the containment is leaking like a sieve and groundwater is coming in. So you've got groundwater in direct con contact with the hot radioactive core and it's leaking out of the building. And they can't prevent it now from moving because if they drop the groundwater now, they're going to suck more um, radiation into their pumps and further contaminate the Pacific. Now, that was a bit of a long question, long answer, but let me tell you this. I told the Japanese about this in 2011 and they told me back Tokyo Electric doesn't have the money to do it. Now we're a hundred billion dollars into this problem and we're likely going to spend another 400 billion to solve it. It's a myth. I wonder if somebody would have uh, cowboyed and cowgirled up with some change if they'd had any idea that it wasn't just going to go away. I mean, you know, I asked this question on, on Coast to Coast. Why is the world not rushing to Fukushima to try and, and, and neutralize this horrible problem? What is their problem? And then after some months had gone by, and then a year goes by, it was, and then another year goes by, it's like, well, the reason they're not rushing there now is because there's nothing they can do about it. Do you agree that there's nothing they can do about it now? Is it just... Uh, you know, I did this for a living. I, I decontaminated nuclear power plants for a living. And there's very little that can be done now without incredible exposures to thousands and thousands of, of young men. Um, and the, now the question is that really about the only thing they can do is encase the nuclear core in concrete and walk away for a hundred years. Um, and, but they still have that, have to get the groundwater down so it doesn't invade the concrete. So they, they, you know, they chose to build an ice wall and I, I said all along that wasn't going to work and it hasn't. If the ice wall had worked, they were going to freeze the ground down to, gr down to bedrock. Their electric bill to keep it frozen was going to be $10 million a month. How much? <laughs> so $10 million a month to keep it frozen. It didn't work. It's stupid. But they, it's a huge number. An ice wall. Yeah. Well, I'm not even a nuclear engineer, and I thought that was a dumb idea. I, I really did. I'm not saying, oh, look, I was right again. It's like I thought it was a stupid idea. You're going to build an ice wall, really. You're going to continue to let this stuff bubble and boil down there, and the ice wall is going to save the world from the disastrous consequence of this triple meltdown. I'm sorry. It didn't grab me as a very good idea. You know, there, there, there is an example of a, a zeolite wall working. Up near Buffalo, New York, there was a, a, a waste plant uh, called West Valley. And they had cesium leaking out of the plant. And uh, they built a zeolite trench all the way around it. And son of a gun, it stopped the cesium from leaking out. So you know, we really did have a good fix at the time. And, um, and still no one is willing to, uh, uh, to try it. it. It's terribly frustrating for me and for those of us that really think that there was a solution. Well, now let me ask you this, you know, the, uh, the whip site out there, the, uh, are we still producing 6,000 cubic meters 
of radioactive waste per year, or was that just the amount going to the WIP site out there in New Mexico? Well, the, the WIP site is handling old reactor waste that dates back to the bomb project. So none of that is, is being produced. What they're finally doing is taking it from laboratories like uh, Sandia and Los Alamos, and they're shipping it to WIP. So it's not like it's new radioactive material. It's stuff that we've held above ground for, you know, 50 or 60 years. So, um, uh, but WIP is not yet working. You know, I guess your readers, listeners might recall that they had a uh, explosion on Valentine's Day in uh, 2014. Luckily, it happened at night when there were no people working in the mine. If it had happened during the day, it would have been disastrous because they would have inhaled that, that radiation. Um, but they still haven't started whipped back up. We're going on to two and a half, three years now. So all of that waste continues to sit above ground um, waiting for WIP to reopen. And frankly, I'm not very optimistic uh, at least portions of it will ever open. It strikes me as a really bad idea to continue to use nuclear energy. In your opinion, how badly would our industrial initiative in just this country be if we just shut them off and did something else? You know, it's it happened in, in Japan. You know, Japan had uh, uh, 30, had 54 nuclear plants and they accounted for 35 percent of its production um, before Fukushima Daiichi and they shut them all down for now five years, uh, almost five years, and uh, son of a gun, Japan continues to be there and, and uh, continues to be a, you know, a major force of, of uh, international commerce. Now in the United States we have um, 99 nuclear power plants and um, they only account for about 19 percent of our power. We have, a, we have a huge reserve margin so we could shut them down if we want it. As a matter of fact, uh, maybe 20 of them are on the verge of shutting down anyway because they're just not economical. Um, so the precedent does exist for shutting nukes down and on top of that, um, life goes on. We're working on it. At Fairwinds, we're working on a report. It'll come out in about a month. So your readers and listeners are getting the, the very first uh, cut at this. And we can clearly show you know, you'll hear people say, if if my nuke shuts down, global warming's going to increase and the polar bears are going to die. And the, the contribution of nuclear power to all of the global warming gases, if we did without those nukes, we would only increase global warming gases by 3%. So we've got 450 nukes around the world, and they only are improving the amount of CO2 going up in the atmosphere by 3%. So we're not doing it for global warming, that's for sure. Well, it's interesting because um, I thought that carbon dioxide was really good for plants. I, I, I think they have to have it. What, what Are you into that stuff, the, 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 uh, the, the global warming thing and the, oh, carbon dioxide is a bad thing and all of that? I mean, there are many reports that say, no, actually the Amazon rainforest and other forests uh, around the world are beginning to improve, if anything. I mean, well, what, do yeah, you make of, I, what do you make all this? It's stupid. I agree that CO2 is good for plants. That's that's for sure. But I'm with the 95% of the scientists that think it, it's bad for the planet and that it's going to cause the sea, the sea level to rise. You know, and that, but whether or not we, we agree on that, it's the argument the nuclear industry is using to keep running. You know, when I was building these plants back in the 70s and the 80s, nobody was talking about carbon dioxide. Everybody was talking about the energy shortage. We had gas lines at the pumps and all that stuff. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think you and I might agree to disagree on whether or not CO2 is a problem or not, but it is what the nuclear industry is using as the, the, uh, the false argument to, to build new nuclear power plants and to keep these ones running. And it's just a, any individual power plant is less than a hundredth of a percent of the amount of gases we're throwing up every year. So it's, it's peanuts, and it, uh, it's a marketing ploy. A marketing ploy. I'll tell you, 
<laughs> what is the old expression? Madison Avenue never gives up. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I guess they don't. Let me ask you something. Go, uh, going back to the, uh, the the thing that happened in Japan. What is the role of salt water in this? I, I have a I have a note to ask you about this. Is it a corrosive factor or? Or what, what, what's the importance of the uh, the salt factor? Yeah, this is another. Um, I think this might be a first on the uh, on the air as well. Um, nuclear plants are designed to be cooled with the purest of water. You'll see those crystal clear pictures of the fuel pool, and the water is has to be ultra pure. Well, after the uh, the the meltdowns began. You know, we had the tsunami, we had the earthquake, and then the meltdowns began. Um, the plant didn't have any pure water because the pure water tanks were right next to the ocean and they got destroyed. So there was, even if the pumps were working, there was no way to get pure water in. There was no pure water on site. So what the plant manager did, this is the guy who since died of cancer, uh, he said, well, we'll get some fire trucks in and we'll drop their hoses into the Pacific and we'll pump Pacific Ocean water into the nuclear reactors. The people at Tokyo Electric thought that was a really bad idea. Uh, but, you know, he, the plant manager, who in my opinion is, uh, should be uh, the world's hero for how he handled the, uh, the accident. Um, the plant manager said, I don't have a choice. So he pumped the Pacific Ocean water into the the hot nuclear reactors. Now, it's salt. Anybody who's ever had a boat or seen a picture of a boat, they rust in salt water. Um, it, it's so salt is sodium chloride, and um, the chlorine, the chloride item ion, uh, is real, real aggressive in um, it, on stainless steel, which is what the nuclear reactors are made of. Back in 1972, I, I hate to admit I'm that old, but I, I worked on a, a nuclear plant in, in Connecticut, and we broke a pipe that allowed 62 gallons of, uh, of salt water per minute to get into the nuclear reactor. And in 15 seconds, all of the stainless steel tubes that, that monitor the neutrons in the core, essentially tell you the power level, failed. So after the leak, 15 seconds after the leak, we had no idea what the power level was. The reactor scrammed, it was down for a year because the, the chlorine and the salt had attacked the stainless steel so severely. So engineers have known now for 50 years that salt water and nuclear power plants really don't play well together. So what, what the engineers downtown, 150 miles away from the reactor, were afraid about was that the reactor would crack when the chlorine hit it. Well, the plant manager said, look, it's going to crack anyway. I've got the, I'm, I'm in the middle of a meltdown here. Tell me a better way of cooling this core. And they couldn't come up with any. And he said, screw you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. So he injected the chlorine into the reactor. He injected salt water into the reactor. Now, that had one good, good advantage and three or four really bad things happened. The good advantage is it did cool the core somewhat. But the bad things were that all of the stainless steel inside that core cracked and uh, it likely increased the speed at which the nuclear core melted through the nuclear reactor. And then the worst thing yet is that that salt plus that hot molten blob of radioactivity lying on the bottom of the containment, um, uh, the salt accelerated the rate at which that that blob of radioactivity ate its way into the concrete containment. So if we don't have a meltdown all the way through the, the, the nuclear containment, um, we were very close. Um, so salt is, uh, is something that no one has studied yet. Uh, the, both the, the Japanese and the Americans really don't want to take a good hard look at the impact of injecting ocean water into Fukushima. Yeah, you know, the plant manager was stuck between a rock and a hard place, and, and uh, uh, I think he did the right thing. But in the process of cooling the reactor, he also cracked the reactor and likely increased the speed at which the, uh, the, the concrete was, uh, uh, began to deteriorate. So it was, a, it was the, the best of a bunch of bad decisions. 
<clears throat> you know, you would think that at 2015, you know, you expect to, to hear the 2015, we're living in the rarefied world of the future. And people just seem to be getting dumber, Arnie. Is that just me getting older and being grumpy? Or are people just turning into morons worse than ever before? Um, I, I think on the nuclear power issue, you're absolutely right. We should have the, the vibrato, which you were great at. <laughs> I'm not even going to try rough to on your it. larynx, I'll tell you that. <laughs> you know, the, the, um, there's so much money. You know, when you, when you borrow money from a bank, the bank wants collateral. And we all we all know that whether you buy a car or a house or whatever, when you borrow money, the bank wants you to back it up. Well, the utilities in Japan have been borrowing money for five years to keep these 50 nuclear reactors, keep the staff paid at these 50 nuclear reactors that aren't running. Now the fix is in because they the the, the banks wouldn't have given that money if they didn't think they were going to get it back. So there's been a promise that don't worry, sooner or later, these 50 nukes are going to start back up. And, and to my mind, that's a terrible bargain to have made because, you know, Japan is the most seismically active place on the planet. It's got the highest population density. You get lots of people near lots of earthquakes. And, oh, by the way, there's 50 nuclear plants. So, uh, yeah, I think, um, I think we're getting dumber with time. It's uh, it's it's absolutely insane, and you're such a gentleman. I mean, I didn't want to just start to, you know, start a food fight right here on the program, so to speak. Let's attack that table over there, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, why in the hell would somebody build 54 nuclear plants in an in an area known over the centuries for earthquakes and tsunami? I mean, I can I, I can tell you the answer if you're into conspiracy theories. The, um, the real reason why those nuclear plants were built was that, well, first we had Nagasaki, uh, which was a uranium bomb. Uh, then we had Hiroshima, which was a plutonium bomb. And then, 10 years later, there was a, uh, a huge hydrogen bomb explosion called, um, oh, jeez. I'm sorry, I can't. The name has skipped my mind now. Was it the uh, thing that had, they set up at Bikini Castle, Atoll? Castle Bravo, right. It was the Castle Bravo test, and it was 10 times more than the scientists thought it would be. Oh, was that all? Yeah. <laughs> it, instead of two megatons, it turned out to be 20 oh, megatons. No. Oh, and oh, they didn't so, see this coming, right? <laughs> okay. So there was a Japanese fishing boat 100 miles away, and it was called the Lucky Dragon 5. And they saw the flash, and they were 100 miles away. And they, um, about three or four hours later, it began to rain this white powdery stuff like snow. And they began to get sick. They didn't realize it was radiation sickness. But then they pieced together that the stuff from that cloud and that bomb that they had seen were related. And they realized that the Americans had done it. So they did not want to tell the Americans that they were now contaminated because they were afraid that the American Navy would sink them and kill them all. So they beelined back to Japan where a lot of them died of radiation sickness. Well, the State Department, the American State Department was terrified that Japan would become an anti-nuclear colony because, you know, they just had two bombs drop on them and now they have this hydrogen bomb as well. Uh, and so the State Department came up with this plan to give Japan nuclear power plants. And that's how we got Fukushima Daiichi. So, you know, the poor Japanese, they got, they got nuked at Hiroshima, nuked at Nagasaki, nuked on the uh, Lucky Dragon 5, and, and, and now we've nailed them again at uh, Fukushima Daiichi. It's been, uh, every one of those is an American design. We bribed them with two new plants for free? Yeah, yeah. So that's why they're General Electric plants because we gave them a couple right that's sick. that's how general electric got their foot in the door to build nuclear power plants in uh, japan if it weren't for the castle bravo test and the lucky dragon five the state department would not have forced the japanese to buy nuclear power plants i don't even know how to react to this i really don't to me that is the most abominable 
form of treachery. I'm so bad. I, I, I gotta tell you, Arnie, it just makes me proud as punch as that lunatic. I don't even remember his name now. Who is the, that? that yeah. who is, who so, it, the you know, John, is, is it any wonder now that the 70% of the Japanese don't want nuclear power plants? Uh, no, we, I can kind of see their point. Yeah, we bombed two of their cities. We bombed one of their, one of their fishing boats. And now we've destroyed a, a Fukushima prefecture. And I, I think they can be a little gun shy here. Yeah, Hubert Humphrey. Remember, he was proud as punch of everything. Yeah, I, I tell you, it makes me proud to be in America, knowing that the uh, government <clears throat> of of this uh, of this land just continues to perpetrate things like this on the world. It's it's yeah. just stunning. You know, I was never one of those guys. Was like, it's the government, man. This government is evil. This American government is evil. I was never one of those guys. I was like, the hell with it. We're Americans. Let's go get them. Let's go conquer the rest of the world. I mean, we bring good things everywhere we go. Well, we have to back away from that position. <laughs> like moonwalk backwards away from that. Ooh, just kidding. So, our, mm, no, I keep hearing about stuff being shut down here and there. It pops up on the scope and then it's gone. I'm not going to say it's scrubbed, but uh, where are we with Hanford? And where are we with uh, Diablo? And, and where are we with all of this stuff that, that's cracking at this... The, the containment vessels are cracking and everything else. What, what's going on stateside? Yeah. Um, well, let, let's talk about Hanford is sort of separate from the others because okay. Hanford is a, a bomb factory. And we built it in the early 1940s. And, you know, everybody was afraid of the, the Soviets and communism. And um, they were using enormously uh, toxic chemicals to strip the plutonium out of the nuclear fuel that was coming out of Hanford to make lots of plutonium bombs. Well, the goal was to make bombs and not really to handle the waste. So now Hanford's got legacy nuclear waste. It's not running now. The, the only thing Hanford should be doing right now is to be cleaning up Hanford. It's not like there's any operating reactors there. But the uh, what, what's happened, though, is that the... Um, the Department of Energy has done a really poor job of the, with the cleanup. And, you know, we're 70 years, let's see, 40, 1940, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and, yeah, 70 years into making bomb waste at the Hanford site, and we still haven't processed a gallon of it. And it looks like it's going to be another 70 years before it's completed. So we've got a 140 or 150 year legacy to clean up the mess that we started in 1940. You know what, the big fear, and a whistleblower came forward on this to his credit. Um, uh, the whistleblower identified that these storage tanks can blow up. Uh, a chemical reaction can cause these tanks to blow up and contaminate Washington state and, and a lot of the states downwind. So that forced the Department of Energy to go back and say, uh, first off, they tried to fire the guy. And then ultimately, the guy prevailed and, and won a $4 million settlement against Department of Energy for trying to screw him. Um, but now they've had to remodify all of the chemical systems because he was right and because Hanford could have blown up. So um, we're stuck with bomb legacy waste that we, we built to fight the communists in 1940. Um, and we likely will be stuck with them until almost 2022, you know, 22, um, yeah, 2200, the next century. So this legacy waste issue is going to be probably $70 billion more and uh, likely 70, mil 70 years longer. It's a, it's a real mess. I so, like, yeah, but that's, that's the bomb issue. The other issues you talked about are operating nuclear plants, and that's a little different. Well, has anybody done the math on, can you tell us approximately how, how many cubic, I don't know, yards or meters, whatever is your choice, of nuclear waste? The, is there such a thing as an average size nuclear plant, or do they all vary in size? Uh, well, they're around 800 megawatts, probably on average. Uh, uh, so that's, you know, 800 megawatts. That's 800,000 kilowatt output. Uh, per reactor on average. Some are smaller, some are bigger. Um, you know, the, 
the, the big issue is what's in their spent fuel pools. Um, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission allows them to store these old nuclear fuel rods. They take them out of the reactor and move them and put them in a fuel pool for 40 or 50 years. And each one of those reactors has, on average, the amount of radioactivity in 700 bombs that we dropped on Fukushima, um, that we dropped on Nagasaki, rather, I'm sorry. So they, the content of the radioactivity in those fuel pools is 700 times the Nagasaki bomb at every one of 100 nuclear reactors around the country. Um, it, it's frightening to realize how much nuclear waste we've got sitting in fuel pools waiting for a, uh, a place to store it. Well, uh, inevitably, we come back to the same question, which is, why? Why? I mean, are these people just so fixated on, on selling reactors and, and the money that, that, that comes from the sale of them and the maintenance of them and the upgrades to them and the repairs of them and everything else that they're, they're willing to risk polluting the entire planet to continue using this stuff? I mean, what's the matter with everybody? Arnie, I don't get it. Yeah, it's really lucrative. Um, the average kid right out of college with a nuclear degree um, starts, this is no experience, you know, four years college bachelor's starts at $90,000 a year. Um, it's a real lucrative business to be in. So I think the people that are in it want to perpetuate that lucrative business. But, uh, you know, we looked at the cost to mitigate carbon dioxide. You and I are going to disagree on whether we need to or not, but the nuclear industry is saying we do. And if we try to take to reduce carbon dioxide by 20% using nukes, it would cost $16 trillion. That's more than a gross national product of America. $16 trillion. So I think there's your answer. You know, that there's a hell of a lot of money on the line. Okay. Well, of course... Uh I mean, the, I guess the, the, the easiest comeback for that one is, well, there's, there's always a lot of money and new ideas, but nobody wants to be first. But a lot of, yeah. a lot of people want to be next, but not very many of them want to be first. So I guess we're just going to have to wait on the, uh, the human race to evolve a little more in its thinking before we uh, you know, can, can kiss this stuff goodbye. But even if, we, even if we shut down, you know, Australia, I understand, shut down all of their, uh, their nuclear power plants. Uh, Dr. Helen Caldicott led her campaign over there and, and, and got them to abandon it. Is that true? Did they abandon it? Well, there, there are no nuclear plants in Australia, uh, in part because of Helen Caldicott. Um, but, but Australia is one of the three biggest exporters of uranium. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they're mining it and giving it to others, Sean, even if they're not, even if they're not using it themselves. Wow. Um, and um, uh, that's along with Canada and Canada, the Soviet Union, the United States. But the big one is Australia. And their big client is China. So um, it's, you know, they claim to be holier than now and that they don't have any nuclear plants. But they're more than willing to sell that uranium. I don't mean to take a license within range of your hearing. But isn't this just a circle of bastards? They just, you know, it's like, well, yeah, well, we don't use it, but here, we'll sell it to you. You can use it. It'll be fine. I mean, man, I'll tell you, it makes such a strong case for the devil running this planet. I can think of nothing else that, that seems like a, a better idea as to what's wrong with this place. You know, the, the nuclear industry has this idea that uh, when you th they want you to think of a nuclear power plant as clean. Yeah. But if you look at the whole cycle... From taking it out of the ground, you know, the, the biggest radioactive accident we ever had here in America was not at Three Mile Island. It was at a Native American reservation three months after Three Mile Island. There was a, a uranium mill, and they were stripping the uranium out with acids. And they had this huge storage pond, and the acids ate a hole through the dam that was holding the storage pond back. And it released uh, probably 10 to 100 times more radiation into a river that has totally contaminated Navajo land for now you know, 35 years. It was called Church Rock. It's out in uh, New Mexico. 
So, you know, at the beginning of this process, it's anything but clean. In Moab, Utah, there's, a, there's another one of these uh, facilities. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission made the owner store uh, set aside six million dollars to clean it up and the cleanup now has hit a billion dollars. So guess what? They've got bankrupt and, and it's you and I and the public citizens that are paying to clean up this mess. So the front end's a mess. You know, we've got Daiichi to show us the middle doesn't work very well either. And then of course on the back end we've got no place to store it. So it was never well thought out from the very beginning. Well, I'll tell you, I just feel uh, <laughs> I just feel more confident that everything's going to be okay with every passing minute. Unbelievable. So, uh, have any of power plants been actually decommissioned in this country recently? Has anybody abandoned any plant? Well, there's um, there. There were 250 power plants that uh, applied to be constructed, and 130 of those were canceled before they ever ran. So um, that leaves 120. Now there's 99. So 21 have already shut down, and about a dozen of them have been reduced back to a farmer's field, um, with the exception of the fact that there's nuclear fuel still waiting to be removed. But everything else, all the structures are gone at about a dozen power plants. Um, the other 20, roughly, um, are in a mothball status. They call it safe store. I call it SAF store. It's, it, the industry spells it S-A-F-S-T-O-R, and they pronounce that safe, but I think your third grade teacher would scold you if you pronounce S-A-F. It should be SAF store, like SAP here in Vermont. Um, so we're sitting on these nuclear plants for as long as 60 years. At the, the Hanford Reservation, there's a bunch of these old nuclear plants, and what's happening is rodents are getting into the plants, and then they go out into the fields and, uh, and uh, leave their droppings. And the droppings are so radioactive, they can pick them up in a helicopter at 1,000 feet. So they, they track these rabbits uh, because of the rabbit droppings off into the woods. Then they pay guys to go out and shoot them, 75 bucks an hour to go chase rabbits and shoot them. Um, they, and the guys call this bunny money when they're out there hunting these contaminated rabbits. So um, we've, we've cleaned up a few, but we've got a lot more to go. Uh, let's go back to Diablo Canyon just for a minute. Isn't that a seismic area it's located in? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, uh, to me, it's, it's the most dangerous plant still operating. And there are a lot of dangerous ones, but it is the most um, if you kind of close your eyes and think of the West Coast, um, just up at Vancouver, which is right over the northern border with Canada, and then down by Washington and into, um, into Oregon, there's a huge place where the two plates, the Pacific Plate and the, and the North American Plate, are overlapping. And it, it creates something called the Cascadia Subduction Zone. And... Um, the last time it broke free was in 1600. And there's no written accounts of it, but the Native Americans talk about uh, Seattle being flooded by a tsunami. So, you know, Seattle's pretty far inland, and, and the, the areas around Seattle are, um, are prone to another tsunami if this Cascadia subduction zone breaks free. Well, that's connected into another fault. You might have heard it, the San Andreas Fault which is connected into the fault that runs right next to this Diablo Canyon plant. Um, and there's a couple of them there, the, the Shoreline and the Hosgree Fault. Uh, they're all interconnected up and down the entire coast. Um, the problem here is that when the plant was built, they never realized that these offshore faults were there. And engineers build a plant based on how fast the ground moves. And that's called the G rating and Diablo Canyon was built for a ground movement of 0.4 G. G is the acceleration of gravity. But this new earthquake, they believe if, if one of these faults were to break, will produce a 0.75 G earthquake. Um, 
Diablo keeps sharpening the pencil and showing that they can continue to run. But to my way of thinking, uh, they've run out of lead. It's just, it's, just not, uh, it's just not safe for what we continue to find, these hellacious fault zones right offshore. Does a man in your position uh, uh, experience a lot of blowback from uh, pro-nuclear industry representatives? Um, yeah. yeah. First of all, let me say, I go to bed at night hoping I'm wrong. You know, uh, I, <clears throat> I told Maggie um, three weeks before Fukushima Daiichi, she asked me what's the, what, what plan is most likely to have a meltdown. And I told her, I don't know which one, but I know it's going to be a General Electric Mark I reactor, which is exactly what Fukushima was. So, you know, I just, I just pray that, that I'm wrong. I pray that, that when the big one hits, it, the plant will have already been shut down. You know? But the blowback from the industry is frequent, and um, um, you know I try not to let it get to me, but you know it, it has to. We've, um, you know, I, I I think you're aware that you know I lost my job as a nuclear whistleblower in 1990 um, because the Nuclear Regulatory Commission deliberately blew uh, an inspection. I found some violations at the license, the company I worked for, and told the president of the company and he fired me and then I went to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I didn't do it first. I went to the president of the company first. And um, so they came in and couldn't find anything. Um, then I went to John Glenn who was a senator and, and uh, he fired up an inspection and that uh, inspection found all sorts of stuff. So then he also found, and the key is that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission deliberately tried to screw me. They deliberately falsified their inspection report in an effort to keep the nu nuclear power you know, clean, safe, and reliable. But ever since then, uh, we continually get, get sniped at. When I was out in California, I had, um, uh, I had a couple trolls show up at one of the, uh, the speeches I gave and harass me. And um, there's also some pretty serious online uh, harassment that's going on as well. You know, you, you just, uh, I hate to get emotional here, but, you know, I, I, I used to be angry, uh, uh, but you, you, can't, you can't perpetuate yourself if you work on, on anger. You, you've got to come at it from, from love as opposed from anger. I know it's probably way too philosophical here, but... Not really. Uh, it's beautiful, man. Keep rolling. You, you know, what, what keeps me going is that... Uh, uh, I really love this earth and want to make it a better place. And uh, as long as I keep feeling that feeling, I'm going to keep going out there every day and, and trying to make it safer. For my kids, I just had a grandkid for the first time. So my grandkid, now I got skin in the game for another generation. So um, I, I, I think that's really the key to uh, what motivates Maggie and I is, uh, is love for the planet. And we just want to make it, uh, make it a better place. Isn't it amazing what people will do? You know, it says, it says in the Bible that the love of money is the root of all evil. And people are like, oh, the Bible, that's just a comic book. Oh, oh, really? Is it? No, it's true. How many benefits, inexpensive benefits to human beings are available that are kept secret because some outfit wants to protect their profits and they, and they get with other people and, that, are, that are also players in the, in the same industry same commercial venture, whatever, and they just decide they're just going to circle the wagons and they're just not going to let this be known to anybody because it'll dig into their profits and they just don't want that. Even if it's bad for people, mm -hmm. it, makes no, it makes no difference to them whatsoever. It's like, it's, it's, it's absolutely amoral, which is, of course, I'm sure, some of the underpinning uh, reason behind people being anti-capitalist. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think as long as you've got human beings involved, they're going to find some way to mess to mess up whatever apparatus you you put them into. They're going to find some way to get around it, go under it, uh, you know, modify it to their own ends, and and put themselves at the advantage, and put anybody else that's necessary to put at the disadvantage at the disadvantage. That's that just seems to be the way of things. Oh well. Yeah. So so well, just to just to recapitulate here. So how how many from a peak of just tell, tell us those numbers one more time, Arnie. Uh, no, there, well, there were 250 applications to 
build nuclear plants. Yep. 130 of them never got finished. Some of them got pretty far along before they they closed the doors, and some of them never got to a hole in the ground. But uh, so 250 applied, 150, 120 got finished, and 21 of those have shut down for a lot of different reasons: accidents and just money. So now we've had five nuclear plants shut down in the last 18 months. Um, used to be 104. If we were doing this a year ago, it would be 104, and now there's only 99. Hmm. A little bit like that song, 99 Bottles of Beer in a Wall. You know? um, and uh, there's another 20 or so that are likely going to close because they're just not economical. You know, you're looking at something that's 40 years old, so the maintenance costs on them are astronomically high. The staff costs are high. You know, when you're paying a kid right out of college to make $90,000 a year to work there, um, the, the operating budget is really, really high, and they just can't afford to keep them running anymore. So we'll probably be down at around 75 plants in the next couple of years. Well, that doesn't sound too awfully bad. Do you, uh, By the way, before I forget to ask you, why did you predict that it would be a General Electric Mark I that failed? Is it because it's the oldest one or what? You know... Um, I, I, I am not clairvoyant. Uh, the nuclear industry knew that the Mark I design was the weakest design. Uh, I just spoke about it. You know? I got you. The, 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 um, in, when I was an engineer back in 1976, um, they discovered that the forces on the Mark I containment um, were in the wrong direction. Um, what they had thought when they built these things that if there were to be a, an accident, the, the forces would be down and they'd hold the nuclear power plant down. So they built all these Mark I reactors and they uh, discovered five, six, seven years later after they were all running that the forces weren't down, that they were up. So that if there had been an accident in the first five or six years of the power plant, this whole darn containment would have lifted off like a rocket ship. So. Uh, they put straps over top of it to hold it down and, uh, and got by. So that was the first problem. And then in the 80s, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission wrote a report that said that if there is a meltdown, there's an 85% chance that the containment will fail on a Mark I. 85%. So, you know, but they, they, they also said, well, there's no possibility of there ever being a meltdown. So what do we have to worry about? Um, so after the, uh, the meltdowns at Fukushima Daiichi, there was a, an NRC engineer, a guy named Chuck Casto. He's really high up in the management at the NRC. And uh, he was quoted three days after the accident in a phone call saying, the Mark I containment is the worst containment in the world. I mean, he, he didn't just come to that decision. He's known it for 25 years just like I did. Uh, you know, it was an accident waiting to happen, and, and it did. Uh, it, it's so sad that all of the nuclear industry knew that that was the weak link, and none of the nuclear industry did a darn thing about it. I wonder what the chances are that, that the tr attrition might apply to the philosophy of using nuclear power. Do you envision perhaps a, a situation where, like these other plants, that, uh, that weren't finished. Well, I, I have to ask another ask, uh, question first. Of, uh, okay, so you start off with over 200 applications, about 130 of them just kind of went away. But how many, and, uh, and forgive me if you've already answered this question, but you've got my mind just spinning all over the place. How many have been decommissioned because of uh, a re reasons other than they're not profitable? We're going broke running this thing. We've got to go back the other way. Well, a couple of them had, had meltdowns. You know, there was uh, obviously Three Mile Island yep. and, and Fermi 1, which was right outside of Detroit, had a meltdown and was, uh, was shut down because, you know, a serious thing broke. Um, out in California, we just had uh, the San Onofre reactor shut down because a serious thing broke. In Florida, we had a plant shut down because uh, uh, they cracked the containment. Uh, they, instead of... Uh, uh, hiring an experienced contractor to, who knew how to cut a containment open, they decided, well, they had slept at a Holiday Inn Express one night, so they had become experts. They tried to cut it, 
and they crack the containment, almost like the crack in a Firestone 500 tire. So there's a bunch of plants that have either melted down or broken. And then there's another group now um, led by Vermont Yankee here in Vermont and uh, Kiwani in, in, in uh, Wisconsin. Um, but shortly, the Pilgrim plant in Massachusetts is already scheduled to be shut down. The uh, Fitzpatrick plant in New York State is scheduled to be shut down. And the Oyster Creek plant in New Jersey is scheduled to be shut down. And all of those are for financial reasons. They just don't make economic sense. Nothing's broken at them, but they just don't make economic sense to run. So, you know, we've got some that just broke and some that are broke. Gotcha. Well, I'm just I'm just wondering if, if it's possible that at some point in the future it may be just not economically feasible to to run nuclear power. I mean, in other words, everything has a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm just wondering if uh, do you see them maybe running out of string at some point? Yeah, and I think um, you know, despite all the hazards that you and I have been talking about now for quite a while. Um, it's going to boil down to money, and uh, there's a lot of indicators on the horizon that they're just not going to be able to succeed to get the money that it takes to build them. There's a power plant being built in uh, in England right now. It's called Hinkley Point, and the power out of that plant, the uh, British have already committed to spend uh, to give the Chinese 16 cents a kilowatt. If they if they build the if they build that power plant, if 16 cents a kilowatt hour, so that's at the what we call at the bus bar. That's as it as the power leaves the plant boundary and it heads into the grid. You know, your electric bill is probably less than 16 cents now, but that includes generation costs, which are around five or six cents, plus all the wires and the transmission and the distribution and the meter readers and all that stuff. So. This is 16 cents as it leaves the plant. At the same time, we're finding wind, uh, offshore wind with almost the same availability at three cents and solar at five cents. So we're, we're rapidly seeing renewables like wind and solar much cheaper than, uh, th than the nuke. Now, the, the quote I gave it, I gave a speech over at Northwestern University a couple months ago in the the quote that ran around the world, 600,000 uh, 600, people listened to it, was that uh, the nuclear industry would have you believe that uh, the mankind is so smart, we know how to store nuclear waste for a quarter of a million years, but at the same time, mankind is so dumb that we don't know how to store solar electricity overnight. And I just don't believe that's true. <laughs> well, all right. I'll tell you what, why don't we pause for five minutes, get a little leg stretch, you know, okay. whatever, and let's resume in five, okay? Because i got some more questions I want to ask you, Arnie Gunderson, and I'll tell you what they have to do with, and that is um, poking the Russian bear. I'll give you a hint. Poking the Russian bear with the stick in its cage, trying to get him to come out and pull a nuke on you. And, uh, you know, we were just chatting about some, it's like, you have to tell the people this. So Arnie asked me a question, and the question was, John, do you know why they call them nuclear power plants rather than atomic power plants? And I said, why no? Why do they call them nuclear rather than atomic plants? And Arnie said... This is a, another one of those fascinating insider stories. Um, back in the 50s, they did call them atomic power plants. The, one of the first was in Shippingport in Pennsylvania. It was called the Shippingport Atomic Power Plant. And of course, we had the Atomic Energy Commission, but the nuclear industry realized that if we call these, that well, they held focus groups and they asked people, which are you more comfortable with, an atomic power plant or a nuclear power plant? And the focus groups told them that people were terrified of the word atomic power plant because it reminded them of bombs. But if they called them nuclear power plants, it made people much more favorable to the technology. So. Now, you know, you and I, it just sort of rolls off our tongue, nuclear power. Um, and, of course, what do we have now? We have the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So even the government bought into it. It's that idea of framing the argument. You know, the, the, uh, the atomic industry 
realized that if they were going to make a lot of these power plants, they couldn't call them atomic power plants, and they changed the name. I'll tell you what, the presentation is everything, isn't it? <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's, abs that's but, but you know, that's, why am I not surprised? Really, I should have seen that one coming. Although I think atomic sounds better. Look, there's Mayberry's atomic power plant. Wow, you guys really are in the future, aren't you? Oh, yes. We dwell in the future with our atomic power plant. In fact, you could say that, that this toast was produced by atomic power. Doesn't it taste better already? Golly. Oh, sick. Totally sick. Oh, well, it's a sick world. And, and so what? We must, uh, I suppose, revel in the sickness. If we don't, we'll, I guess we'll never get well. All right, so where are we? The, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. I haven't looked at the... At the, doom, the <laughs> should be the Bulletin of the Nuclear Scientists, shouldn't it? Uh, Bulletin of the Atomic <laughs> Scientists says... Uh, uh, I don't know, we're a couple of minutes before midnight, <clears throat> before the world goes away. I haven't looked at it lately. It's depressing. But uh, that's, that's, that's part of the reasoning behind the name Caravan to Midnight. What's going to happen now after the old clock strikes 12, yes? So uh, where are we with nuclear proliferation and, and all this tension between, uh, you know, the NATO, or whatever you might call it. I, I'd say NATO now stands for no action, talk only. But uh, where are we with uh, nuclear weaponry these days, Arnie? Uh, it's, um, it's a frightening time to, in nuclear proliferation. Um, you know, the the, um, the Japanese have enough plutonium to build a thousand nuclear bombs if they wanted to. And who gave them that reprocessing technology but the Americans? So we don't even have to go to the normal hot spots in the world to um, uh, to realize that proliferation is is everywhere, and it's not just the bad guys, but it's our allies too, um, but let's go to Europe, which is probably where where you were uh, they were thinking. You know, we've got uh, we've got the Ukraine, which is a point of of tension between uh, you know Russia and, and NATO. Um, but we just had a fascinating incident in the Ukraine, a really scary incident in Ukraine, where Ukrainian nationalists blew up the transmission lines down into the Crimea. And you'll recall that the Crimea was annexed by the, the Russians. So um, what that did was it caused all of the nuclear power plants in the Ukraine to shut down because the entire grid collapsed. Then that the concept is called a black start. Um, nuclear plants can't run unless the grid is up and running. So. Um, about a dozen nuclear power plants in the Ukraine shut down and the only thing between them and meltdowns was their diesel generators. Of course we know what happened to diesel generators at Fukushima Daiichi. So now here's a point of tension between NATO and, and the Russians um, that could have escalated into a nuclear meltdown if those diesels had failed. Um, you know we've got from the real proliferation standpoint, going into the segment, you asked how small can we make a bomb? You can make a bomb about oh, 20 pounds, about the, the size of a suitcase. Um, the holy grail a, of terrorism. Yeah, <laughs> they, they actually had backpacks, nuclear bomb backpacks that uh, troops would carry. And they, um, they would go, uh, they were designed to blow up a bridge. You know, you'd send a couple of, uh, uh, of uh, a couple well well armed people in and take a bridge out with a nuclear bomb. So essentially, the size of a backpack is all you need. When the Soviet Union collapsed, there was a lot of enriched uranium all over the place. And um, to its credit, uh, Russia and the United States did a pretty good job of getting most of that enriched uranium. But you know, you only need 20, 30, 40 pounds to make a bomb. So there certainly is that much out there on the loose. Now, there's been a couple of cases every year where small amounts, you know, a pound of enriched uranium uh, tries to get sold to a, from a smuggler to a buyer. Uh, now, the buyers have been uh, Americans in disguise, and we've captured probably 
five smugglers a year trying to get uranium out of the old Soviet Union and try to sell it to ISIS or uh, you know the the Iranians or or whatever. Um, so the, the the proliferation risks of stolen enriched uranium are still very real. Um, th there's the other concept too. You know, Obama said the thing that scares him most, that keeps him awake at night, is the chance of what's called a loose nuke. You know, somebody like um, a, a bomb stolen from Pakistan or a, a bomb made in Iran or you know, bomb grade material smuggled out of the old Soviet Union to somebody who doesn't like us very much, uh, being uh, smuggled into the United States and fired off in the center of a major city. Uh, it's, a, it's a frightening time because there's so much nuclear proliferation. And, you know, we let the genie out of the barn here. We let the, the horse out of the barn back in, you know, 1945 when, when we dropped those nukes. And uh, once it's out, it, there's no getting it back. All right. Well, the, you I know, wonder, there's a there's another uh, type of bomb. They call it a dirty bomb, yeah. and it's really not a nuclear bomb at all. And there was another case where some smugglers were smuggling a large quantity of cesium out of the old Soviet Union, and again they got caught by American agents. And you got to hope that the American agents are catching every single one of these smugglers, but that's kind of unlikely. Um, but what you do is you take a, a regular bomb and you put cesium on the outside of it, you truck it into a city and blow it up. And what that does is it spreads radioactive cesium into the city, making it uninhabitable. It's not a nuclear explosion, but the residual radioactivity left over is uh, significant enough that you'd have to evacuate the, you know, the inner city of a, of a large metropolitan area. So, you know, that's a very real risk, too. What about this thing at Indian Point? Somebody dropped some control rods or something? I mean, it went. I, I, there's nothing on it since the 7th that I've seen. But, uh, yeah. you know. I haven't, I haven't seen much either. Um, there was a, at Indian Point, um, the control rods are, are um, pulled up. And as they're pulled up, the nuclear core begins its, uh, nuclear chain reaction, the, the, the criticality. And they're held up by, by magnets and electromagnets. And what happened was there was a fire in the electrical cabinets that feed those, uh, uh, feed those control rods. So they lost electricity and they dropped in. Which is good. I mean, if they're, you'd rather have them drop in than, than fall out. So, yes. um, but the, uh, the, the cause of the fire was that it's old. You know, Indian Point now is, uh, Indian Point 2 is 43 years old. So, you know, we're, they need an upgrade. And, and Entergy, the, the owner, is, uh, is uh, really cheap. They, they don't take care of their preventive maintenance. I served on a panel uh, here in Vermont where we looked at Vermont Yankee and we had these huge leaks into the uh, groundwater around the nuclear plant. And we determined that it was because Entergy didn't do the preventive maintenance. So Entergy hired its own panel to look at Indian Point. This is back now 2009. And they determined the same thing, that Entergy wasn't spending enough on preventive maintenance. So now we've got a fire in Indian Point because it's an old plant. And, and we really shouldn't be surprised unless you're willing to spend a lot of money to keep these plants in tip-top shape, uh, these kinds of problems are going to happen again and again and again. We, we call this thing the bathtub curve. Uh, and I'm going to use my hands here on your, on your Skype. Um, nuclear plants, when, they, when you buy them, are unreliable. It's just like cars. You know, if a car is going to break, it's going to break in the first month. And then you're going to work out all the faults, and it's going to be very stable for a long period of time. And then as it gets old, it becomes more unstable again. So it sort of looks like a bathtub. And uh, most of the nuclear plants now in America are over 30 years old. The average nuclear plant in America is uh, more than 30 years old. So, you know, parts start to wear out. Electrical wiring starts to get brittle. 
so we can expect more of these problems as these plants get old and we shouldn't be surprised when they happen okay a couple of a couple of rapid fire numbers here 20 to 30 pounds of nuclear material will will produce a bomb that would be how big in your opinion oh a lot smaller than than the the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs, but you know they were they were designed to be tactical. You you sneak them into uh, a, a railroad bridge or, and uh, you know and take out the take out the the bridge and, and, and some of the people nearby. So you know it would be maybe a tenth of a mile in radius. You know they they used to have uh, uh, tactical rockets, not these big ICBMs. They used to have cannons that would fire a shell. You know, seven, yeah, they could fire them out of a 106 or coilless rifle, as I recall. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I had a, a, a dear friend of mine who died of cancer was uh, one was in the army in '54 when they were dropping those bombs, and then they had the guys hunched down in the trench, and the blast would blow over them, and then they'd get up and they'd run toward the bomb. <laughs> and, yeah, a lot of those guys died. Jesus, and, I'm sorry, uh, man. That's insane. That's a, that's another cover up because what uh, the army said that his the path he took was, you know, instead of heading straight toward the bomb, the army said, well, really he he went diagonal to the bomb and not right to it. Uh, then and he said that's a bunch of bull. He said we went right to it. So they tried to cover it up by minimizing the exposure to these. these Good thing but I didn't anyway, join the service. I'd have been the guy running away from the bomb. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. There were probably sergeants back there with guns to make sure that didn't happen. But, you know, the, these these weapons, these small tactical weapons that weigh, you know, they can put them in a backpack, uh, can take out perhaps a tenth of a mile in radius. Uh, that's bigger than a conventional bomb can do, but they're, they wouldn't destroy a city. And, and like I said, that's Obama's biggest fear is that a, a, a loose nuke will, uh, will arrive, uh, you know, maybe on a freighter or maybe in an airplane or, or whatever. Or maybe and, walked uh, across the border of Mexico and Texas or Arizona, uh, yeah. you know, uh, with some refugee that's trying to find a better life. Yeah, uh, yeah. My guess is, uh, my biggest fear personally is that uh, the loose nuke will come from Pakistan. Um, we know that their uh, their security agencies have been infiltrated by radical Islamists. We know that the Pakistanis have something on the order of 120 bombs, um, and uh, uh, that's just a bad combination. So, uh, you know, we should be worried about Iran, and we should be worried about North Korea, but uh, we you know, officially Pakistan is an ally, but. Uh, it has been infiltrated by radical Islamists, and that really scares me. Yeah, a couple of them, have apparently, at least according to the news reports, who knows who really did it? Some people are saying, oh, craft services did it. Not craft services, but that's that's the people that provide the snacks and movie shoots. Sorry. Uh, craft International did it. Uh, police weapons found there. Blah, 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 blah. But officially, it's like the, the woman, Tashfeen, or whatever her name was. I think that's it. Um, Tashfeen was from Pakistan. So, you know... I don't know. What do you think about this? Uh, you might not want to get into this. We'll ask anyway. I'm thinking it might be a good idea to like vet the people who are coming from the Middle East a little more carefully before you just go. Yeah, sure, come on in. Well, you know, I, I, I think we do we should do a better job of background checks. Apparently, this, the the woman who was involved in that massacre out in California, had already written on on her Twitter account. Uh, for years, that she wanted to perpetuate a jihad. So, yeah, well, you know, I think I think you know, you know we we owe it to ourselves to do thorough background checks. But I'm not one to to throw up a, a wall and say everybody uh, should not come in. I don't I don't think that's fair. You know, my my grandfather came over. My father went to school here, and uh, he started kindergarten and couldn't speak English. So it's it, it's hard for me to say you know no immigration because your uh, grandfather. Well, my grandfather came over, but my father was born here and uh, grew up in a little Norwegian enclave in Carteret, New Jersey, and didn't speak English until he went to school. You know? So it happened. Yeah. Maybe we should just put a sign up at the border that says, population full. You know, you can detect nuclear weapons as they come into, and actually they have them. Um, uh, 
you know, I'm right up here in Vermont. We we're only an hour away from the border with Canada, and I had a uh, uh, technetium 99M, a heart thing, about well, five six years ago. Uh, they checked for uh, for something in my heart, and they told me don't go over the border for three days because they'll pick you up. And at these border crossings, you know, and those houses that go over where you drive the car through, there's some really sophisticated radar de uh, radiation detectors. Um, enough so they could pick up the, the little bit of radiation that was in my heart. So when you try to smuggle it in through official routes, you know, highways or border crossings or things like that, it's not likely it's gonna, gonna make it in. But, you know, I just see it coming in on a freighter into Long Beach or to New York or to you know, uh, Charleston, North Car South Carolina. Um, you know, places where before they go through that, that detector, uh, they could be set off and it could be devastating. So um, it's, it's the, that to me is a, the most frightening proliferation risk. You know, North Korea just announced that uh, uh, they now have a hydrogen bomb. Most of the people in the intelligence community don't think they're there yet, but it's not very long before they are. And a hydrogen bomb can be made, you know, a hundred times more powerful than a than an a, a atomic bomb. Uh, we live in a crazy world. Yeah, we do. Now, let me ask you this: um, I understand that the uh, the federal limits have been raised as far as uh, pollution, or pardon me, radiation monitoring, um, atmospheric, and I, I presume terrestrial have been raised in your opinion without going out there with your Geiger counter and taking soil samples up and down the west coast which would be a daunting task at least uh, I understand that the, that uh, we're getting a lot of dead sea life up and down the coast I haven't been out there looking at it myself but uh, we had a very uh, compelling presentation uh, by a man up in Vancouver who said oh yeah you know there's there's way less, uh, way less uh, little creatures out there in the water than there was a while ago. It looks like uh, a lot of them are being poisoned, the melting sea stars and all this. Well, what are you hearing about this, Arnie? I mean, how, how, is it, uh, how is it affecting our West Coast? Yeah, I think there's a couple pieces to that. The, the first is radiation standards. They, a, a group of scientists that are all on the radical fringe that radiation is good for you. It's called hormesis. Uh, you know, here, take this radiation pill and you'll feel better in the morning. Um, they, uh, there's a group of them that have petitioned the NRC to raise the standards. And the NRC hasn't said yes to that yet, but it's frightening the NRC is even considering it. The um, National Academy of Scientists wrote a report called BEER, B-E-I-R, uh, that says that no amount of radiation uh, is, uh, is good for you. They, it's called the linear no threshold theory. And the less you get, the less uh, the risk is, but there's no de minimis risk where it's not, uh, uh, you're not going to be hurt. So I, I go by the National Academy of Science and I hope the Nuclear Regulatory Commission does too. So th there's pressure to raise the standards, but I, I, I hope that uh, the, the, uh, the, the National Academy of Science will win over the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Now, as far as what's going on on the West Coast, that's really interesting. Um, nobody is checking these cadavers for radiation. So, uh, I, I think on our last show, we talked about how I don't eat fish from the Pacific anymore. Yep. Because I just, I don't know what the, well, what's in them. And now, if the government were out there testing these fish, I'd, I'd feel differently. The, the cause of these massive die-offs, and there are massive die-offs. You know, E and E News has done a great job uh, covering uh, covering them. Yes, I um, The the cause of them is unknown, but uh, you know, there's the issue of this. They call it the blob. There's this huge, a uh, hundred thousand mile by a thousand mile by uh, three or four hundred feet deep uh, lens of hot water sitting out there in the Pacific that they claim could be killing them. They also claim there's a lot of uh, 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 infections in these animals that are strange and, and not to be seen previously. Uh, I, I will say this about the radiation from Daiichi, uh, and that's that I don't believe radiation is directly killing them, but the ra radiation is known to be an immunosuppressant. Uh, 
when you when you have large amounts of radiation in your body your immunity drops so I think that the the argument that it can't be Fukushima because the concentrations are too low uh, is unfounded I think there's enough radiation in these animals that their immune systems could be suppressed and that could be uh, one of the factors involved in that massive die-off well, look, have you see, have you felt the need to um, to to decontaminate or chelate yourself? Have, do you take any of that zeolite stuff? And you know, I was uh, uh. I was uh, l looking at it at a, a couple of times, you know, on a couple of occasions in the past, and it's like I saw one spot that says, "Oh yeah, you know, it's it's great for uh, it'll fix you up, it'll get that stuff out there." And I saw another deal over there saying, "No, no, it's been nosed. If you breathe it, if you breathe the powdered form, it could it could cause all kinds of stuff." Uh, yeah. mesothelioma and all kinds of, and I'm just going okay. And, and I, I've said this, I've said this dozens of times. But Arthur C. Clarke was so on the money when he said, "For every expert, there's an equal and opposite expert." <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, the, um, the, the you can take zeolite or there's other what they call chelating agents that um, will strip the body of minerals. Um, you know, for instance, cesium, which is radioactive. Um, but cesium is identical to potassium. And if it's going to be stripping out the cesium, it's also going to be stripping out the potassium. So I tell people that, that want to use uh, zeolite or, or any of these chelating agents, do it with your doctor because you're not just the, the chelation or the zeolite doesn't strip out just the radioactive stuff. It strips out all those minerals. Yeah. And you can become mineral deficient. So if you're going to be stripping out, some of, the, some of it will be bad stuff, but a lot of it will be good stuff too. You've got to be supplementing back in with good stuff because otherwise the, the metallic balances in your body are going to go to hell and, and, and it could actually make things worse. So, you know, my attitude is if you're, if you're going to do it, and I'm on the East Coast, so we're not getting, getting anywhere nailed as much as the people on the, uh, in the Pacific. But if you're going to do it, do it with a doctor and supplement back in good chemicals because they're going to get stripped out too. Yeah. So plan on, plan on uh, I don't know, I suppose you could go on a regimen of it for a while and then go, okay, I'm stopping this. I've gone through the, the process and now I'm going to start... You know, dumping the colloidal minerals in there, and uh, and and put them back, or I, I, I don't know. How do you how do you do that? How do you how do you yeah. tear all the stuff out of your system, and then put it back before you suffer a health problem? That's the real question, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and that's why I, I just uh, yeah I I I won't go there because I'm just afraid that you know if you all once you develop a heart arrhythmia because potassium is no longer available. You read my mind. You know, that's that's not a good thing. So um, you've got to be. I I always think if you're going to be stripping it out, you've got to be adding it back in, so that the the good replenishes those voids that are left behind. Um, you know you can you can get a pretty good idea whether you need to or not with uh, with urine tests and things like that. Um, and uh, uh, most people uh, really have relatively low amounts of cesium in their bodies right now. Um, if you were in Japan, you know that would be a different issue. I would feel very strongly that you should be chelating um, if you live in Japan. You know, I'm going over there for a month, and I uh, uh, one I, I plan not to eat a damn thing from the northern part of Japan, <laughs> and, and and two I'll uh, I will be sampling my uh, my urine when I get back to make sure that I I haven't picked up uh, excessive cesium. Yeah, you might want to make a few zeolite snack bars and pack them in there with some bananas. You know what I mean? Zeolite and banana sandwiches. Oh boy, it sounds great. <laughs> Arnie, you're such a nice man, and you're you're such you're, you're such a bright man. You're just a joy to speak to. Let me ask you this: Here, I'm gonna spring this one on you. Um, what's your message to the world, Arnie? What, what, what's your message to the world? If I mean somebody's got to live, or what was it all for? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. I guess, uh, thank you for that opportunity here. Um, you know, what we at, at Fairwinds are trying to do is just notify people of, of these, these dangers. And uh, uh, I think, you know, 
the, the, the people on the opposite side of this argument, the, the, the well-paid executives in nuclear, are believe that they're trying to save the world uh, from global warming. And so I really feel like I'm trying to save the world from people who are trying to save the world, which is a strange, a strange dichotomy. I think the message is, uh, I am terribly concerned about nuclear for lots of reasons. So the data lead me to conclude you're going to have an accident every 10 years, uh, that the front end is dirty and the back end is, uh, uh, is even worse. So it's never been a well thought out process. But, but at the end of the day, we live in a capitalist world and it boils down to money. And um, if you build new nukes, global climate change will get worse because that money gets sucked out of renewables. You know, instead of spending $15 trillion on a bunch of nuclear power plants, you could spend a tenth of that on the equivalent output of solar. Um, so I, I guess, uh, you know, if we want to be hard-hearted capitalists, this this whole technology makes no economic sense, and you can forget about all of the all of the rest of it, and just you know use that old Tom Cruise line: "Follow the money." Follow the money. That's beautiful. Well, look, I probably won't speak to you between now and the end of the year, but Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and a Happy New Year to you. And we'll keep plugging away at this. You uh, do what you've always done, stay strong, and keep blowing that whistle. Eventually enough people will hear it. Maybe somebody will come up with a new idea. We could use some, yeah? Well, thank you. From all of us at Fairwinds, and it's our yearly fundraiser, too, uh, we wish you a, a happy holiday as well. Take care. Arnie Gunderson. Wow. Well, you heard it straight from the man who's the tip of the spear on all these things. And uh, I recommend going to ENE News. E-N-E News, Energy News is what it means, Energy News. You'll see a little quote from me. It's my favorite website for this sort of thing. <laughs> it sounds a little on the pompous side, but it is. It is my favorite site for this sort of thing. All right, so, you know, we always say, mm -mm -mm, exercise caution in daily affairs. Just don't fall for it. Verify it first. And then if you feel like falling for it, well, you won't have fallen for it. You'll have, you'll have dived into it. Keep your eyes up always. Make ready for what's to come. Have I told you lately? I love you people. Be seeing you.